everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Paul. And my name is Praveen. And today we're going to talk to you about keeping track of your health. So, you know, it's really important that we all keep track of our own health. And while we do rely on our doctors to take care of us, we all should have some sort of role in our health and making sure that we stay organized and knowing and uh, knowing about our health as well. So we have an agenda of a few things that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about logging your health, medications, hospitalizations, blood pressure and blood sugar, lab work, diet and exercise and how we can you know, really keep track of all of these and just make life for ourselves and our physicians easier and keeping us engaged in our own, uh, our own health as well. So locking your health, um, like I mentioned, organizing your health is very, very important. Uh, the reason why I'm saying this is because we don't have the most reliable memory. A lot of the time we remember this one instance, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago in the past where we were experiencing some chest pain or some shortness of breath. And when it is our time for an appointment, we try describing this incident um, only for us to realize that we don't exactly remember what happened. So logging your health and keeping track of your health is a really good way of making sure that we have details on a lot of these events, as well as other um, aspects of our health to make sure that we receive the best care possible and to make sure that you are very involved in your own health as well. It gives healthcare professionals more information to work with. And we're gonna look at blood pressure, for example, where there's a difference between one blood pressure reading and a lot of readings on average. Um, it also helps healthcare professionals avoid medical errors. Uh, medical errors can be involved in medication lists or hospitalization, and it keeps you involved in your health, as I've been emphasizing. Now, it is estimated in Canada each year, there are up to 28,000 deaths due to medical errors. Now, there's a lot of reasons for medical errors. It could be uh, illnesses or infections in the hospital, but a very, very frequent cause is errors in medication. And this is why at Dr. Kearney's clinic, we really strongly emphasize that it's crucial to keep a recent and updated medication list with you at all times. This is especially important, uh, or it's especially important to bring this list with you to clinic. Um, it can be difficult uh, to be confident in changing your medications without knowing what you're currently taking. We don't want to over-prescribe or under-prescribe medication doses. You know, we don't want to give you two blood pressure pills um, or give you a new one if you're already on a blood pressure pill because this can have some pretty significant effects on your blood pressure. Medications can also interact with one another. We don't want medications that aren't very friendly with one another um, and prescribe that to you at once. Uh, we might also not know medications that other physicians prescribe without a medication. For example, um, your family doctor may have recently prescribed a new blood pressure pill, and then you come to our office and we prescribe the pill as well. Without knowing what you're currently taking or what has been um, recently changed, there's chances for mistakes like this to happen as well. Now, common causes of medication errors include inadequate communication between physicians and patients, and this could be in the form of you know, not having a list or us not updating the medications list, um, confusing drug names. So a lot of drugs and medications have two names, a generic name and a brand name, as well as a lot of the names for some medications that sound alike. And medical abbreviations are also a common cause of the medication errors. So having a list and being well-educated in your medications is uh, very important in reducing that 28,000 number of med uh, medical errors each year. Now here we have some examples of some good medications. Um, you can see there's two different types. One is handwritten and one is typed or um, actually comes from a pharmacy as well or from a blister pack. Uh, so there are some aspects of good medications list that I believe are important to emphasize. It's important to have your uh, the name of the medication as well as the brand name or the generic name, whichever isn't given. So here we have a suvastatin. That's the generic name and the brand name of Cresta. Now, while this isn't absolutely necessary, it really helps avoid confusion in areas where um, you know medications have multiple names, and you often get confused with that as well. Crucial to put the dosage. Here we can see we have 10 milligrams, one tablet daily. This is really, really important because it truly does matter how much of a medication you're taking. That's going to change the effect that the medication has in your body. And it's also going to change the results of any test that you have as well. 
Um, it can be useful to know the prescribing doctor and date. For a lot of us, we remember, you know, uh, a medication was prescribed by Dr. Kearney in January 2019 versus a medication that your family doctor might have prescribed or anything of that such, and it just helps us remember a little bit better. The reason for prescription can help you know your own medications better and know your health better. Um, you know, it's it's important to know if you have uh, high cholesterol and you are in need of uh, medications for cholesterol, such as Crestor. There are some other uh, other things that we might opt to put on our medication list as well. One being the time taken. Do you take the medication in the morning, lunch, supper, bedtime? This uh, is more important for some medications, less important for others. Um, typically, it's nice to know for blood pressure medications, for example, if you're taking them in the morning or at night. The number of refills is really important to check on all your medications. And it can be useful to have on your medication list as well. If you do run out of refills, you are going to need to um, come in for a new prescription or call in for a new prescription if it's a medication from my office. Um, a lot of pharmacies also do reach out for their refills automatically as well. But it's just nice to know how much you have left in stock for that medication. Finally, a lot of patients find it really helpful to have uh, descriptions of the appearance or an image of the medication as well. And this really just helps them. It's very practical, helps them know which medication is what. So here we have a description, it's pink, and uh, we have an image here as well. Now it's also useful to organize and keep track of your hospitalization. Now when I'm saying keep track, imagine uh, having a binder about your health. In this binder, you can have your medication list, you can have uh, you know, our records of hospitalizations or records of your blood pressure and so on and so forth. So keep track of your recent hospitalizations. If you're in the greater Hamilton area, our clinic typically has access to hospital records online. However, we do not usually have access to uh, resources or records outside of the greater Hamilton area unless they have been sent directly to us. So keep a record for your own sake as well. It's probably nice to know history of your own hospitalizations and these are things that you can look back on and have the dates there as well. So why did you go to the hospital? When were you admitted and discharged? What did they tell you? And are you feeling better? You know, these are a lot of uh, really important information for hospitalizations and this is a lot of information that we often forget about our hospitalizations. This one is a crucial one. Were there any medication changes as well? So a lot of the time, if you go to the hospital and something serious might have happened, they might have uh, changed some of your medication. Now, it turns out that a lot of patients, um, I believe there's a huge percentage of patients, studies have shown that aren't actually aware of their medication changes upon discharge at the hospital. So always check where any of your medication changed. And if so, uh, you know, write those down. If not, it's something that you can ask about and inquire about to just make sure that you have greater transparency in your health. Finally, some test results, you know, did you go to the hospital for a CT scan or an MRI? Uh, you can write down the test results or you can even ask them for a copy of the test results and keep that in your health binder as well. Blood pressure is another really important thing to log. If you have issues with high blood pressure or low blood pressure as well, um, it is recommended to purchase and frequently use a blood pressure monitor. It's important to check your blood pressure frequently. One single reading in a doctor's office is not reliable. So for those of you that know, um, at our office, we typically try to take blood pressure in every visit. Now here we can see if you have three appointments in a year, it all or every appointment looks like your blood pressure is high. But if you take your blood pressure at home, we'll see that the home average is actually quite low compared to the doctor's office. So this is a phenomenon called a white coat hypertension where your blood pressure is high in the doctor's office, but normal or low at home. And this is, you know, this, uh, this is an example of why it's important to take your blood pressure at home and keep track of that, because what we get in the doctor's office might not always be the most reliable. With that being said, in current times with the whole COVID situation, we are also trying to reduce the amount of uh, blood pressures we are taking in the clinic as well for sake of social distancing. For that reason, it's really important to know how to take blood pressure and keep track of your blood pressure at home as well. So let's discuss how to take blood pressure. Try checking your blood pressure at least three times a week. If your condition is more severe, 
and your blood pressure is something that you have to pay close attention to, check it perhaps two times every day. Two times being in the morning and in the evening. Now, checking your blood pressure actually means taking three readings in a row. A lot of us don't know this, and um, a lot of the time we might only take one reading, or when we're told to take three readings, we'll take it at three different times in the day. However, we should be checking your blood pressure twice a day, and each time you check your blood pressure, it means to take three readings in a row. So we can discard the first reading. A lot of the time, the first reading is a little bit off, we're skewed, and isn't the most representative. And then we can average our second and third reading. And the same goes with heart rate. You can just use the same numbers, average the second and third. So here we have an example. Let's say my first reading is 146 over 87, with a heart rate of 78. My second reading is 133 over 79, with a heart rate of 74. My third reading is 131 over 75, with a heart rate of 72. So like we said, I'm going to discard the first reading, and then I'm going to average the second and third reading. My final blood pressure that I come to is going to be 132 over 77 with a heart rate of 73. And this is what I'm going to keep track of um, and write down in my notebook. You'll notice that the first reading was a little bit skewed, so we discarded that one. Now we have this, uh, we have sort of methods that we use to make sure that we are taking blood pressure correctly. So we try to be seated for at least five minutes quietly prior to taking the blood pressure. Try not to have coffee within 30 minutes prior as well. And do not smoke within 30 minutes prior to taking the blood pressure. Sit in a chair with your feet on the floor and arms supported so that your elbow is heart height. And do not talk while taking your blood pressure measurement. If you take your own morning reading before, oh sorry, if you take your morning reading before medications, be sure to write it down and tell your doctor that you know, this reading is before medications. It makes sense for your reading before your medications could be high uh, if you are hypertensive. That's probably why you're given blood pressure medications. And in that case, it would be important to check again in the evening and see how things are on your medications as well. So here we have this great video from Online Healthcare uh, showing us how to take your blood pressure at home. To get an accurate reading, it's important to take your blood pressure correctly. One of the most important factors in taking accurate blood pressure is having a proper fitting cuff. Once you have the right cuff size, find a quiet environment and rest for 15 minutes. Sit in a chair with your feet flat on the floor and your back straight. Rest your arm on the table with your palm facing upward. The cuff should be level with your heart. Do not talk or move while taking a measurement. Avoid food, alcohol, exercise, smoking, and bathing for 30 minutes prior to taking a measurement. Your blood pressure can naturally fluctuate throughout the day, so taking it at the same time each day will give you more accurate comparisons. For tips on making changes to your lifestyle to lower your blood pressure, visit AmranHealthCare.com. So we can see you know, there's a, there's a few methods that we do try and um, emphasize. So don't smoke, don't have coffee, don't exercise 30 minutes prior. Make sure you've been sitting for some time and make sure that the uh, cuff is uh, heart height as well. So nearby and your palm facing upwards. And then use the same methods we discussed before. So take it three times and then average number two and three. This is really, really important right now because again, given this whole COVID situation, we are reducing the, the amount of blood pressure that we're taking in clinic, and it would be most ideal and the safest uh, if patients were taking their blood pressure at home and providing us with that information, uh, just to you know help enforce the social distancing rule. We can also check our blood glucose. So this may be relevant to some of us, uh, less relevant to others. Um, if you are diabetic, you might have a glucometer to check your blood sugars at home. The frequency of checking depends on uh, the type of diabetes you have and the medications. However, if you are diabetic, it could be useful to keep track of and write in your notebook about your blood sugars. People with insulin typically need to check their blood sugars more frequently because they're at higher risk of hypoglycemic or low blood sugar episodes. Common times to check are upon waking up. So this would be a fasting 
blood glucose, before meals, two hours after meals, and before bedtime. The type of insulin can also affect how frequent you should be checking. For example, it's going to be different in short-acting versus long-acting insulin. Continuous glucose monitoring devices such as Freestyle Libra might be an option for you as well. These continuously measure glucose throughout the day. Now, if you are diabetic and you are on insulin, um, chances are there is someone overseeing your diabetes, such as a gastroenterologist or a family doctor. If that's the case, have a discussion with them on how frequently you should be checking your blood sugar. Now, while this information is useful uh, for other doctors who are managing diabetes, in our clinic, we more frequently look at HbA1c. HbA1c is a glycated or a glycosylated hemoglobin, and it's found in your lab report. So when you go to Dynacare or Life Labs, this is one of the results you get from there. Now, blood glucose and HbA1c are not the same thing. Blood glucose is the sugar in the blood at a particular point in time. You can take this at home just by pricking your finger and using a glucometer. HbA1c is the glycosylated hemoglobin and represents an average of blood sugar in the past two to three months. However, it is in different units, and that's an important point. You know, if your blood glucose at home is uh, 7.8, that's around the equivalent of an HbA1c of 6.5. So you can see the numbers do not equal one another between HbA1c and estimated average glucose. HbA1c, again, is something we get from our lab results, and the estimated average glucose is something that you can just get from a glucometer. Uh, you know, so you might be wondering how you can keep track of your lab results and keep track of HbA1c. Prabhim's going to talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah, so um, with your work, you can usually find um, your results actually online. So as Paul said before, once you do get a requisition form at the clinic after a visit, you can actually head to Life Labs or Dynacare. Those are the two main, um, I guess, like centers that do have lab work being done there. And you can actually check online after 24 to 48 hours of testing um, what your results are. So, uh, sorry, one thing is that's also important to mention, Dynacare does have a fee in order to check online. Life Labs is free to check online, however. So um, yeah, so simply um, Life Labs, you can see like right on the front page that there's a See My Results tab. And once you click on that and log in um, or register your account first, you can actually just see the results. And there are a few things that we actually look out for when we look at our lab work um, at the clinic. So the first thing is your cholesterol levels. So the target value is usually less than three millimoles per liter. And then there's also different types of um, lipoproteins that we look at, such as LDL, um, with a target of less than two millimoles per liter, um, and that number actually varies from time to time. You also have HDL, which at target you want um, more than one millimole per liter, and that's actually because it's seen as a good cholesterol, one that can actually recruit bad cholesterol and take it back to your liver. Um, and then finally, you have triglycerides, which you also want less than 1.75 millimoles per liter for it. Another test um, or another lab result that you want to look for is potassium. So um, you want to look for target value around 3.5 to 5 millimoles per liter. And then finally, or then next, you have um, your kidney function. So you have things like EGFR and creatinine. These measure how well your kidney is able to filter. And um, all the reason why there aren't any target values is because it's hard to, um, I guess, adjust for it. So we don't really look at that as much. Um, but then you also want to look for that. And then finally, as Paul mentioned before, HbA1c, so that's your glycosylated hemoglobin. And um, there's actually a few ranges that we look at. So less than 5.7% for non-diabetic range, um, between 5.7% and 6.4% means that you have pre-diabetes or you're in a pre-diabetic stage. And then if you are above 6.5%, um, within like the range of three months, it indicates that you have diabetes. If you are diabetic, your target should typically be around 7%. And if you do have any concerns about any of this lab work, you know, this is why it's important to keep track of your own health. You can write this down and at your next doctor's appointment, you can discuss this with your doctor as well. So yeah, um, so the next thing we want to talk about is tracking your diet and your weight. So um, we're going to be going later into different types of things that you want to look out for. But just to introduce this topic, um, you want to keep a log, right? And a log is basically, in other senses, kind of like a sheet or any type of way that you can just 
kind of um, record your progress. So um, putting effort into blogging your diet can um, help you be more careful about your food choices because you're actually writing it down and being more mindful about it. So I'll be talking about this later, but there's also apps like MyFitnessPal, or you can even just use hard copy such as paper. You can log how much food you're eating, how many calories you're having per day. Um, and then if that's too tedious, you can simply try to take a picture of all the food you eat and have it um, somewhere on your phone or on your device. And at the end of the week, you can look back at this and see which foods or servings were unhealthy and what you should cut down um, or work to cut down on. And then also, this is very good because it can kind of help you stop and think before having unhealthy foods. So it just helps you be more mindful about what you're eating. So logging your weight is really important to measure and keep track of your goals that you set for yourself, um, you'll be able to see change over time. And personally, and for a lot of people, this can be really motivating. So that's also a really big plus. So the big, or the first thing that um, surrounds diet is nutrition labels. So the nutrition label is basically like your one-stop place for like all your macronutrients to see what is in the food that you're eating. Um, there are a few things to keep in mind and although this can look very complicated, you can kind of deconstruct it to find a few key things on this label. So the first thing is your serving size. And a lot of people actually don't really realize this because it's kind of like at the top written in a small font, but they do give you recommended portions. How much is one portion really, right? So for example, on this image on the right, you can see that it's one bar. Um, so the next thing that you wanna look at is calories. So calories dictate um, basically your energy expenditure and for that reason it's a really important tool to track um, so calories is right below that and then another thing that you can see on this label frequently are percentages now a lot of this is a very big misconception because the percentages may seem like that's how much like that's actually how much based on your diet based on your needs however um, this is based on a 2000 calorie diet so please take that with a grain of salt um, so, for example, for the sedentary elderly, the average BMR is closer to around 1200 calories daily rather than 2000, right? So that's a very big difference and um, these percentages might not be the most reflective of someone in that range. However, it's a very good guideline to tell you what this food is kind of like high in or low in. Um, usually recommendations include that greater than 50% is high in that nutrient and then less is low. So if you can see on this um, image here, you can see that your saturated fat is at 15%. So this might not be the healthiest choice because it does have a lot of saturated fat. Um, and we'll be going into why th that is later. Another thing that's really important about nutrition facts is that um, you can actually keep track of relevant macronutrients for certain diets. So there's recently been a lot of diets that are being um, researched and being put in place. For example, one big one is the keto diet. So um, those types of things, when you want a high fat, low carb diet, how many grams of fat are you eating per day? How many grams of carbs are you eating per day, right? Some people like to restrict it to like 50 grams, so um, 50 grams of carbs. So having kind of like an idea using your nutrition facts is also a very good tool. Um, for example, if you are a diabetic, you want to track your sugar. Um, that's another thing that you can find here under your total carbohydrate um, under your total carbohydrate subheading. So one thing also that's very important is again, fats. So we've looked at um, different macronutrients such as sugar, carbs, but we wanna look at fats now because there are a few different um, discrepancies that people often misconceive. So the big one is that you have trans and saturated fats um, and you wanna limit these. Also, you wanna limit cholesterol and sodium because all these things are in linked to an increased risk of heart disease especially if you have a high blood pressure, it's, um, you might wanna aim for less than 1500 milligrams of sodium daily. So the main difference between um, saturated and trans fats compared to unsaturated fats, which is the other type that's usually included in your foods, is that the chemical makeup is different so that your body responds well to different types of fats. So that's why trans and saturated fats are not the best. Um, and you wanna limit how much you use of that. And one last thing as well, with regarding uh, with regard to the 1500 milligrams of sodium, we are going to have a video on our YouTube channel about something called a DASH diet, this dietary approaches to stopping hypertension or to stopping high blood pressure. Uh, so be sure to check the video out if you want to learn more on reducing your blood pressure through diet as well. Yeah. So now that we have all this information and um, we want to use it in practice, right? So I kind of put an exercise here. So let's say my BMR, so 
Um, just to explain what that is, it's your basal metabolic rate. It's if you are basically not including your exercise or anything like that, what, how many calories does your body burn on a regular day, right? So that is 1,200 calories. Um, so that means I want to kind of maintain how much I eat uh, to be around 1,200 calories if I want to maintain my weight, right? So let's say, hypothetically, I had 900 calories for the day. So lunch, breakfast, snacks, up to the very end of the night, I need to eat dinner. So based on these nutrition labels, and if I was only to have one serving of each, which one would be the best option based on how many calories I've eaten and the 1200 calorie goal I want to achieve? Yeah. So um, now that you're taking a kind of like a pause and check that out, the really big difference here is the number of calories. So I want to have around 300 calories um, plus minus maybe like 50 or 100. And for that reason, it might be better to take um, a look at the right option as opposed to the left option. As you can see, the left one has around 590 calories per serving. It actually also is really unhealthy. You can see that it's very high in saturated fats. Um, just based on the percentage, it's way above that 15% um, mark that is usually used to say that's high in something. And then the one on the right is only 170 calories per one cup. And with that, it can actually let you take more than one serving if you are feeling a little hungry because that'll only reach 340 and you will be around that 1200 range for the day. So the reason why, or what basically these two um, nutrition facts or these, these two nutrition labels are showing, um, the one on the left is actually one of um, infamous uh, from McDonald's and then the one on the right is just a spicy chicken soup from a can, right? So you can see, various discrepancies in the types of nutrients that each one provides, and that is better um, exemplified through the number of calories that are shown. So we did mention um, there are to help track not only your calories, but your macronutrients, um, amongst a lot of other things. And a really popular one is called MyFitnessPal. So I've been personally using this um, when I started getting into fitness and it's been really helpful just because it kind of gives you like a very nice overview of everything that you've been eating and also like your progress throughout the days, throughout the weeks, even throughout the months, right? And it just helps you keep everything on one standard device um, and it helps organize everything. Some people might not like having to write everything, logging something on just a piece of paper. So this is kind of like a little more organized um, if you are more technologically inclined. And we will actually be putting out a tutorial on how to use these applications. We also have a lot of um, workshops being done or an already on um, our website and social media on how to, um, use technology to better track your health. So those are some great resources you can use. So going back to MyFitnessPal, it's basically a dashboard or an overview of your dietary intake for the day. It also can calculate your calorie expenditure. So that's going back to your BMR and using that information to kind of tell you how many calories you need per day based on the goals that you enter. So for example, if you wanna lose weight, right? You wanna eat less than the amount of calories that you're burning. Um, on a daily basis, so it'll kind of calculate that for you. It has a very extensive database of foods. And one thing that I actually really like about this app is that it's been really culturally accommodating. So um, a lot of different foods are on it. It's not just like the very standard foods that you might see on like a regular app. There's a lot of um, foods and options to include on your, um, on your diet log. So that's also great. And then finally, there's an exercise log. So the exercise log can also kind of track how much you've been doing, whether it's cardio or um, just like different types of exercises to help with your conditioning, those can all be put onto MyFitnessPal and it can at the end be accumulated into your dashboard and calculate how many calories you've been burning for the day. So I'm just gonna go through a quick tutorial. Um, so the first thing on this app is the food diary as I was talking about before. So this is kind of, if you can see on the picture here, just a uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner on the very bottom and it's separate into that. So I just put some, um, I just put some like examples, right, of foods that I would eat on a regular day basis and then see how much I've been eating every day. It can calculate how many um, calories that you're eating and the different types of macronutrients, right? So imagine having like nutrition labels, it kind of calculates and adds things up for you. So it's pretty great. Um, and then at the very top, you can see like a very big overview of the number of calories you are eating, exercising with, or how many of you burn through exercise. And again, how many are remaining for the rest of the day that you can use through food or eat through food. 
And then the next part is um, your exercise diary. So this is more like you can either enter it as cardio or a strength exercise, and it will calculate the amount of calories you have burned. And just keep in mind, this is a very, um, this is a very big estimation. However, um, it is a very good estimation and it's based on a lot of things. For example, your weight, height, and the amount of time that you've been doing the exercise for. So for example, in this, exam um, in this picture, I put down having 120 minutes or two hours of playing basketball, um, just shooting baskets around, and it gives me the number of calories I've burned. Um, and then it again puts it on the very top and it adds it together with the amount of calories um, that you've been eating through food. And then it gives you a new number of how many you have remaining. All right, so now we're going to go to the second part, which is exercise. So logging your exercise is a great way to see a record of your physical activity as well as change over time. And you can, again, as I said before, you can log what exercise you did and for how long. Um, for example, you can talk about if you were going on a walk, where did you go, right? How long did you go um, walk for? How fast or what pace did you go at? These can all impact um, how much energy you were burning that, through that exercise. You can also get a pedometer to track your steps. So those are devices that you can buy at Shoppers Drug Mart. Um, you can buy them or you can find them on your smartphone and they're very handy just to tell you how many steps you've been taking throughout the day. And then finally, um, as mentioned before, applications such as MyFitnessPal can also help track exercise and gives you a good estimate of how many calories you've burned throughout the day based on what you input. So another app that is um, pretty interesting, this is a pretty um, new one, it's called Strava. So Strava is actually more for running and cycling, but you can also use it for walking. Um, and if you're someone that likes to see progress, it's something that I would really recommend. Um, and again, just go back to other workshops to see where you can find these apps and um, how to use technology to leverage your health. But with this example, Strava, it kind of saves the routes that you've taken, whether running, walking, or cycling. It calculates the distance and it kind of just gives you a progress log of like your performance, right? So if you're someone that likes to see upwards improvement in your running or your cycling, um, it's great to just have that kind of like logged into an app. And then you can also share this with your family and friends. Um, and you can share your progress. So it's a pretty good app if you're someone that's more goal oriented and likes to do those activities. And then um, one final thing that we'll touch up on, and this is not the only final thing, there's a lot of other stuff, but this is just one very big one, um, it's Apple Health. So if you do have an iPhone or an Apple product, this is a very good um, app to use because it counts your steps and integrates your Apple Watch with other fitness apps. And um, it just organizes everything. For example, if you have MyFitnessPal, that's an app that basically um, Apple Health takes information from and it can add it in. For example, how many calories you've been taking, how, what food types you, or what types of foods you've been eating, and it can kind of take that information and put it onto its own app. And why this is good is because it can kind of centralize everything if you do use multiple different fitness apps. Um, another thing that this can do is track your sleep and nutrition, and it also has a cool section where you can actually add your medication list and emergency contacts, which are so important for the clinic, as Paul has mentioned before. And then also newer models of the Apple Watch have actually been able to um, actually been able to track your heart rate and also have ECG tracking on them. So if you have rhythm disorders such as atrial fibrillation, um, this can be pretty useful. And then um, Although this is only found on Apple devices, and um, also I wanted to emphasize that you don't need the watch for it, but it can definitely help if you do already have it. You can find similar apps on Android, such as Google Fit, which just accumulate all the data, but you wanna keep in mind that um, this might, the features might vary between these different apps. So um, this Apple Health and Apple Watch, as well as other health-related technology will again be discussed in more detail in the upcoming technology workshop at a later date. Great. So that's all we have for you today. Today we discussed how we can really organize and track our health so that you as patients are more involved in your health, but also to have clear communication with your physicians at our clinic and other clinics as well. Like I discussed, there's 28,000 med uh, medical or deaths related to medical errors each year in Canada. Uh, that's one of the leading causes of deaths, surprisingly. And you know, there's a lot that we can do uh, to prevent this as well. And so we hope that, you know, this video helps you organize your health. We encourage you to find a pen and paper if you're not a big fan of technology, 
write down these things, write down your weight, write down your blood pressure. We showed you how to take blood pressure correctly. Um, write down your diet or take pictures of the foods that you're eating and use a lot of this to reflect and set new goals for yourself to remain healthy. And we encourage you to bring these logs, whether it's a notebook or it's a binder or it's on your phone, bring these logs with you to your appointments and you can show um, our students or you can show uh, any of the other doctors that you're seeing as well. And, you know, it'll be great because you are learning more about your own health and there's a clear picture and a lot more information clear communication for your physicians too. So again, thank you for your time and hope to catch you in another video. If you are interested in more technology, we do have technology workshops that are teaching us how to use technology for our health. And if a uh, discussion on the sugar and HbA1c interested you, we do have a series for uh, Sugar Club as well. So check those out. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you.